Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to my Unit 1 presentation. Today we'll discuss the relevancy of Prussian military philosopher Karl von Clausewitz in the era of contemporary war. Here's our agenda. I'll give you a quick introduction, then I'll start the main presentation by discussing the key takeaways from On War. Following this, I'll give an abridged version of what some of Clausewitz's most ardent critics and supporters say about him. Then as kind of a practical exercise in using Clausewitz, we'll examine the 2014 to present day Russia-Ukraine war through the eyes of Clausewitz. Uh, in closing, I'll offer my own thoughts on Clausewitz's relevancy in the era of contemporary war. A few administrative items up front. Uh, we're gonna say that the time frame that the era of contemporary war encompasses, at least for the purposes of this presentation, is the post-Cold War era. Uh, so that'll be 1991 and beyond. Uh, please note that I have also included the references of the articles I've drawn information from uh, that'll be at the bottom left-hand corner of each slide. And then finally, I'm going to be using the J.J. Graham translated version of On War. Okay, a quick introduction is appropriate for the few of you that I have not shared a, mo a module with before. Uh, so my name is Stephen Johnson. I'm a U.S. Naval Aviator and I've been in the service for uh, just under 26 years. My family and I are stationed in the United Kingdom, living just outside of London in a town called Gerard's Cross. I currently work at NATO's Maritime Component Command in Northwood. Uh, it's an interesting job and as you can imagine, uh, very busy these days with everything that's going on in the Black Sea. In order to understand if Clausewitz is relevant to the contemporary war, we need to know what he's talking about. From Book 1, Chapters 1 and 2 of On War, I pulled seven key ideas that I think are Clausewitz's most important thoughts. Number 1. War is an instrument of policy. Now, as you know, this is a recurring theme in On War. This thought is wrapped up in perhaps the most famous or most popular quote from Clausewitz, which is, which is the title of Section 24. War is a mere continuation of politics by other means. But what does he mean by this? Well, he's, what, what he's trying to tell us is that wars are fought for reasons of policy and political ends. And when I say policy, I'm using Mary Caldor's definition, right? Policy as external in terms of relations to other states. A policy objective or a political objective, and I'm using those two terms interchangeably, a political objective is the desired end state. Violence and war are the means to achieve it, just like any other method. War is therefore a political act. It uses force and it uses violence to achieve a political effect. The political effect is the objective and war and violence is the means. Point number two, war trends to the extreme. In section three of his book, Clausewitz tells us the side which uses the maximum level of force without regard to the level of violence it produces will gain the advantage over the belligerent who uses anything less. Now this naturally drives each side to escalate over and over so that they both move to the extreme in an effort to obtain victory. Now this concept of the extreme level of war, sometimes referred to as the ideal war or absolute war, this is an abstract idea, at least in Clausewitz's mind. He uses it to help his readers understand war better. It is what war would look like in a vacuum, free from all other constraints, such as rationality or material limitations. However, reality is different. We know that. In reality, war doesn't usually achieve its absolute form. Which leads us to point number three. And point number three is the concept of friction. Clausewitz introduces us to the concept of friction, which he says is inevitable in war. Friction refers to anything which will slow war down. Now it can be self-induced, like a political restraint, or it can be something that we encounter like bad luck, uh, or, the, or that we fail to plan for, like logistics, uh, or something that is inherent to humans, like a lack of discipline or, or fear. And it's only through the friction of real war that we're going to avoid ideal war. Point number four, 
Probably the most confusing idea that Clausewitz introduces is the idea of the wonderful trilogy. In the interest of time, I'm not going to quote uh, his passage, but it's in section 28. He said, War was a paradoxical trinity between primordial violence, hatred, and enmity, probability and chance, and policy and its subordination to reason. So at one corner of the triangle, we have violence, hatred, and, en and enmity. This is also often associated with or found in the population. And Clausewitz tells us that this must be present prior to war. However, if it's left unchecked, it leads one to extreme and senseless violence. And this extreme senseless violence is not, uh, is not connected to policy or any political objective because it is blind instinct. It is the complete annihilation of the adversary. So that's corner number one. Corner number two on the triangle is probability and chance. This is, Clausewitz says, where the soul has permission to act freely. So here Clausewitz means the operational art that is required to see through the friction of war. So those are corners one and, two, one and two. And then the third piece is war as an element of policy and its subordination to reason, right? So in order to conduct a successful operation, Clausewitz tells us that all three of these corners, right? All three of these elements of the Trinity must remain in the correct and unique balance according to the unique identity of the war one is fighting. So to achieve a decisive victory, it is necessary to pursue war through the Trinity. So in summary, the support and participation of the population are required to wage war successfully. War should only be declared for political aims by the government and professionally directed by the military, which sees a mass army, I'm sorry, which needs a mass army to implement the new kind of war. This is what determines the outcome. So for Clausewitz, the Trinity was a tool for strategic analysis. If you overlay this model on the states which are at war, you can use it as a tool for, uh, for assessment. You can determine how the three dominant tendencies on one side will interact with the three tendencies on the other side of the, of, uh, of, of the, uh, of the conflict to to make an analysis of, of, of the situation. All right, moving on to point number five, we have Clausewitz's thoughts on the nature of war and on the character of war. This will be a little bit of a partial repeat of my fourth point. But Clausewitz tells us that war's enduring nature consists of four continuities and that no matter how war changes, they are always present. It has a political dimension, a human dimension, and uncertainty, right? So those are the three parts of the paradoxical trinity. And then you add into that that there is a contest of wills, right? And that describes the nature of war, right? So if the nature of war is constant, he tells us that the, he tells us that the character of warfare or the means and methods by which they are which wars are fought, right? The character of war is always changing, like a chameleon, he says. And then both the nature and the character of war and warfare, respectively, both of these things affect strategy. Next, Clausewitz tells us that the battle, or the fight, is the decisive means in war. So this is in the context of an 18th to 19th century warrior, right, where superior maneuver to the point where you can convince your enemy that he cannot win and force and, and you force him to surrender without battle this this was common right so for Clausewitz war is an act of military force to compel the enemy to do your will right you don't maneuver for the sake of maneuvering you you maneuver to engage in violent combat and kill the enemy and finally Clausewitz tells us something very important about the use of theory, right? He says in section 10, right, and this is a little bit confusing of a, of a sentence. He says in section 10, the probabilities of real life replace the extreme in the absolute required by theory. 
So like I said, it's hard to make sense of those words, but what he's telling us here is his views on the role of theory to the officer, right? He says that there are so many things going on in war that theory helps to clarify the concepts and ideas that have become so complex and confusing. It allows you to peel them apart and examine their, their subordinate parts. So as commander of the Kriegs Academy, he wanted to educate the minds of the future commanders of Prussia, right? He didn't want the commanders to arrive in combat, starting with everything new in their mind. However, he did caution against taking theory to the battlefield. To him, it was simply a tool to educate the commander. So, what do contemporary scholars have to say about Clausewitz's relevancy to our understanding of contemporary war? Mary Caldor questioned his relevancy. Though she accepts some of Clausewitz's propositions, she believes his thoughts on war and its tendency to extremes are no longer applicable. She believed the post-World War II conflicts we see are the wars Clausewitz described when he discussed wars which came after the, quote, barriers closed again. Unquote. And this quote comes in Book 8, Chapter 3, Section B of On War. This barrier that Clausewitz mentioned is a red line not to be crossed. It represents nuclear weapons, and crossing this line risks destruction of civilization. I believe that what she's saying is that the wars prior to nuclear weapons were old wars. The new wars she sees are fought post World War II, and they're small, limited, and low intensity. Again, I think that the point that she's driving to is new wars cannot be fought in order to defeat the enemy. The enemy's defeat is only brought about through annihilation, which of course means most likely mutual destruction in modern nuclear warfare. Caldor also questions Clausewitz's validity because his old wars are wars with an aim towards external policy with political mobilization as the means, all right? Because she says external policy, she's talking about interstate wars, right? These are old wars. Caldor's new wars are the ones that characterized the 1990s. And she said that they are instruments of politics, right? Politics, right? Remember, politics are inward facing, right? So these, these new wars, they're instruments of politics. And they're fought over identity politics or the claim to power in the name of religion or an ethnic identity. Finally, Caldor acknowledging uh, Clausewitz in that war is an act of violence based, I'm sorry, that war is an act of violence to bend the opponent to our will, says she would rather expand on Clausewitz's definition of war, right? She would redefine it as an act of violence involving two or more organized groups framed in political terms. According to her, war can now be either a contest of wills, just like Clausewitz says, or, in addition, a, a war of mutual enterprise. So John Shepard also joins the uh, anti-Clausewitz club. Shepard stated that Clausewitz's concept of war is not, su not sufficient for modern American leaders. So he looked at three developments that Clausewitz's concept struggles with, including nuclear weapons, transnational constabulary warfare, and modern statecraft. And I'm only going to talk about the nuclear issue, uh, as I don't think that his second and third arguments hold much water. According to Shepard, Clausewitz's concept of war accommodates evolution in warfare very well. However, like Caldor, Shepard believes nuclear weapons and their delivery systems have removed many of the barriers or limitations that Clausewitz envisioned. Their speed of delivery and destructive capacity creates the possibility of what he describes as uncontrollable escalation with levels of destruction incompatible with any rational political objective. And remember, rational political objectives are an inherent characteristic of the Clausewitzian concept of war. Therefore, the Clausewitzian model of war does not translate to nuclear warfare, at least, coursing, at least according to Shepard. John Keegan is also another scholar who believes Clausewitz's theories don't have relevancy. Now, Keegan said Clausewitz's central premise that war is a continuation of policy by other means 
and that policy influences war. Well, he said that this premise was not true. He stressed the fact, at least according to him, that how wars are fought and the conduct or nature of war was culturally driven. He doesn't think that warfare can be a, a rational activity because it causes more harm than good, even if you win. He also stated war is not politics because it is conducted by people whose values and skills are not those of statesmen. Finally, Keegan argued that the type of warfare Clausewitz knew was limited to a certain period of history in a certain geographic location. And the final Clausewitz critic we'll discuss is Martin Van Creveld. He believed Clausewitz was uh, obsolete after the fall of the Soviet Union. So he talks about the Westphalian order, right? Where states enjoy the monopoly on the use of force and use war to achieve political objectives. And he says that the, as the Westphalian order waned, Clausewitz con, Clausewitz's contributions were no longer germane. Thus, he rejected Clausewitz's trinity. So moving on to the supporters of Clausewitz, let's look at uh, Villikers and Basford. All right, in their article, Reclaiming the Clausewitzian Trinity, they take specific aim at both Keegan and Van Creveld. Villikers and Basford state that pulling out of mistranslated discrete bits of wisdom for criticism, as he accuses Keegan and Van Creveld of doing, as what we would call in baseball an unforced error. Right? Villikers and Basford state Clausewitz integrated his thoughts incredibly well in On War. They say Clausewitz's concept of the Trinity established a relationship among war's dominant tendencies that come forth only in a complete understanding of his work. So I guess that they're implying Keegan and Van Creveld don't have, have a complete understanding of On War. They feel that the Trinity is key and one can identify all of Clausewitz's profound insight with one or another element of the Trinity. For Villikers and Basford, then, it is the Trinity's ability to envelop so much of the nature of war that makes it a timeless piece of work with relevance today. Last but certainly not least, we come to Hugh Strahan, who pretty much rebuffs all criticism of Clausewitz. Of Mary Caldor's interpretation of the Trinity, he states she has misinterpreted Clausewitz's texts. He says, Caldor misses the point. Clausewitz said the nature of the war was characterized by a Trinity consisting of violence, hatred, and enmity, the presence of warfare, I'm sorry, the presence of uh, probability and chance, and a reasoned political objective. These things, the nature of war, may be manifested in the people army, and government, but they, meaning the people, army, and government, do not make up war. Strahan implied that Caldor mistakes the vehicle for the underlying reason. Regarding Keegan, Strahan simply states that Keegan, that Keegan oversimplified a very complex text. He believed Keegan's central premise was wrong and that all wars are fought and that how wars are fought is not culturally driven. Strain also counters Van Creveld's argument by rejecting the uh, for Strain also counters Van Creveld's argument for rejecting the Trinity discussed a few minutes ago. Strain, admittedly, only in so many words, says that all Van Cre all Van Creveld's arguments may have told us is that Clausewitz's models and theories are more applicable to interstate conflict. Finally. Strahan mentions the former U.S. Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral William Owens. Talking about the immediate aftermath of the First Persian Gulf War, Adams stated that the commanders in the field had been granted an omniscient view of the battlefield through technology that allowed devastating firepower and maneuver to deliver the coup de grace in a single blow. Now, while Strahan did not counter Owens in his article, I'm going to mention the Admiral here because I think the time has proven Owens wrong. The same technological advances he described now also draw the curtain of fog over the battlefield, especially when you're talking about advanced militaries and advanced state actors. Okay, finally, and I know this presentation is going a little long, so I'll be brief and to the point, 
I'd like to take a look at the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine through a Clausewitzian lens to see how relevant he remains in the most recent of contemporary wars. If we can see where Russia and President Putin have applied Clausewitz's principles and had success, or where they have failed to apply them and been unsuccessful, I think this will help to validate Clausewitz's continued relevancy to our understanding of contemporary war. I think Clausewitz would have probably been a pretty tough instructor when he did have contact with the students at the Kreese Academy. He would have been very tough on President Putin and his advisors. I think he would have given President Putin a reprimand for asking a lot of concessions from Ukraine and expecting very little resistance in return. He would also not look kindly on the general staffs neglecting the operational rhythm and operational tempo of the battlefield. The Russians took entirely too long between the withdrawal of, from Kiev to the restart of the offensive in the eastern Donbass. They also seem to have neglected, or at least made a very poor estimate, of the logistical requirements to support the army in the field. However, Clausewitz would praise President Putin for the overall use of war for a political purpose. The Russians tried, however disingenuously, policy negotiations first, and when the negotiations failed, they moved down the spectrum towards politics by other means. Clausewitz also would have given high marks to President Putin for his attempt to use the passion of the people to help mobilize his resources for war. Common themes we have seen so far involve ethnic nationalism, the West is plotting against us, we must defend Russians abroad, the Ukrainians as brothers, and the denazification of Ukraine. Clausewitz may, however, caution President Putin that this can also be dangerous as support fades as information about the war becomes apparent to the Russian population and the Trinity may become unbalanced. Also, in a throwback to the early days of the conflict in 2014 in the, in the Donbass, the covert nature of the Russian involvement led to friction and fog, which helped the Russian strategic plan overall. So I think Clausewitz would say that the nature of the war in the Ukraine has not changed in this instance. The contest is truly about the contest of wills, and this is evident in the, in the fact that the Ukraine is massively outgunned, but they're still holding out. However, the character of warfare has certainly changed, especially within the information domain and through the widespread use of drones. To wrap up our discussion, I'll give you my thoughts towards the question this discussion is based on. Does Clausewitz remain relevant to our understanding of contemporary war? Based on what I read in On War and the articles with the pre-digested Clausewitzian analysis, plus what I see in the news headlines, current events in the world, etc., I would say yes, he is very much still relevant. War remains an instrument of policy. States still have a political instinct that they wish to achieve, and when necessary, they use violence to achieve it. In recent years, we've seen states conduct military operations and use violence against non-state actors. But the only implication this has is that maybe those conflicts cannot be characterized as wars. Battle is still the decisive means in war, even if as technology advances, much of the military's strength and resources are put towards non-kinetic effects. They are simply used in support of combat operations. Clausewitz's Trinity is still a valid analytical tool for understanding the nature of the wars we fight. And while Caldor and Shepard give convincing arguments regarding the use of nuclear weapons in the Trinity, this doesn't mean Clausewitz is irrelevant in broad terms. After all, no single theory must answer every question to remain relevant. So uh, thank you for joining me today. I hope you, uh, hope you learned something. I appreciate your time and patience. And of course, in the words of the great American pop culture icon, Porky Pig, that's all, folks. <laughs>